Jim Gustafson, professor of psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin Medical School, giving my 12th of 32 lectures. Today's lecture is called Taking in the Whole Situation from the Third Position. Now, I'm going to have to be fairly telegraphic in reporting a consultation, leaving out many remarkable aspects of the hour to point to the decisive forces. Let me suffice to say that our patient found herself bullied in corporate life to the point of not being able to continue. In continual panic and in despair. Her huge pair of dreams conducted in the company warehouse under spotlights shows the whole situation in two extremes, these two dreams a week apart. So. Uh, let's have a look at the left hand of, of the board, which ha has my telegraphic diagram of the dream. Ed's got us up there, and, and I'll explain it to you. The f so he, it reads from top to bottom. In the first dream, she finds her in the middle of a circle of her bosses and peers, standing on a chair with a noose around her neck. I put the, the area within the noose in orange to... In, to intensify your sense of, of that. And she's trying to debate whether to take the noose off or to step off the chair and strangle herself. Now, as we discuss her predicament, she seems quite ready to take the noose off her neck, it, but it seemed like a security blanket, oddly. And it was, because it was a kind of an addiction, difficult to dispense with uh, this blanket, this security blanket. So it's a noose and a blanket, security blanket at the same time. And the blanket comes from her family. And her family has a long and actually prestigious history of material security and prestige, which, which are its very honor. So her family needs her to keep the noose on. And that is a certain comfort to be in grace with the family. All right, the second scene a week later. Same warehouse under the very same spotlights, positioning has totally changed. Now she's walking up and down in front of the bosses sitting in chairs. She's flashing a pair of scissors, and they glint sharply in the, in the spotlights. She's menacing them. She's menacing them who menaced her. She has turned the tables, dangerously. The, and not only that, She's announcing a set of tortures for the bosses. The first boss is, and the most hated, is about to be killed by crucifixion. The second a boss uh, by drowning in a huge tub. The first co-worker by lethal injection. And finally, the second co-worker on a funeral pyre. So let us return from that picture. Oh yeah, the third, no, let's not just for a second. The, the, her at the bottom will come back to. That's her sitting calmly back in a third position from the whole situation and being able to use the sharpness that evolved in the second drawing to modulate it. But we'll come back to that. The second drawing is very dangerous, but the force in it is very necessary. So we'll come to that. So I ask her her feeling, and she says it is a feeling of power, of great satisfaction in getting even. I ask her how the second dream bears on her predicament of getting out of her pain and doing what she wants. The shears seem decisive to her and to me and come from her home. They have been an instrument of creating things, as you can imagine. Now they are instruments of a kind of creating of evil, of an eye for an eye. I ask her if she's read Dante's Inferno, and she has. And she he agrees this is the originality like his of inventing suitable deaths for those who have tormented her. I ask her how that helps. I'm a little concerned, you know, for my reputation. Mm -hmm. if she begins to do these things, right? Great, great work, Dr. Gustafson. <laughs> the first boss is crucified. <laughs> Not good. She says it helps her to get out of the box of sales in the, the sales division in the company, of security with a noose ever tightening around your neck. 
strangling her. Quite like the patients of Breuer and Freud, all of them, they used exactly that word. They were self-strangulating in order to hold on to security. You could even say we have a whole culture that's doing this. She feels ready to use her powers of creating in a more suitable position in the company. More immediately, the final detail of the dream of her ordering her, this is the second dream, ordering her assistant to put the first nail in the hand of the supervisor, nailing him to the cross, feels to her like a suitable menace to the other three tormentors not to mess with her. My letter summarizing the consultation ran as follows. Your dramatic pair of dream portrays two extreme positions. The first position is of being surrounded by the firm with a noose around your neck. The second position is of menacing them, twirling your scissors, flashing in the light. Of course, the first position is of surrender. And the second position assumes a power that is impossible to wield. So the third position is implicit in the comparison of the first two. It is possible to have a certain quiet fierceness to look out for what you want while negotiating with what they are willing to offer. Yeah. I imagine, I said to her, your subsequent dreams will make your third position, which takes in the whole situation, more explicit. It is a pleasure to work with you on this. Two days after the consultation, I met with her in the resident, and I was struck immediately by finding her in a third place. She looked 10 years younger, and she was full of sharp comic wit, scissor-like wit, huh? It gotten emerged here. Uh, being able to reduce to absurdity the current boss's insecure rigidity. She even was much less intimidated by her and even felt sorry for her. Of course, the working through the third position in negotiations with the company is, is it's still in, I, I see her now, and it's still being negotiated. Now, the, the study necessary to conduct this kind of consultation, looks like we got lots of time. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take this little drama in a company warehouse and I'm going to put it on a very big scale for you because it really is the, what I think is going on in the whole culture. And, and as I say, in the whole Mississippi River Valley, and I'll tell you how that is. Now, 41 years ago when I was a resident, um, I, would, I remember I would get one idea and I thought, oh, this is it, you know. And the idea then that everyone in my class had was that you had to confront resistance, right? You can imagine what that would, how that would miscarry with our patient who needs exactly to be in charge herself of what we talk about and at what pace and what order. But, you know, youth. Now, as Michael Serre, you've never heard of Michael Serre, but you can look him up, S-E-R-R-E-S, argued in his thermodynamics, patients get sick from being unable to cons construct the intersection of radically different spaces with radically different energies in which they find themselves. And then their bodies explode. More precisely, one surface explodes into the other's surface. Like the f in, the first, in the first scene, the, the company is basically exploding into her head. You see? Their, their energy is, is exploding into her. The second scene, she's exploding into them with with revenge, right? So um, the patient's body is the intersection of the forces. Now, one of our residents watching the consultation sent me, a, who happens to know a lot about thermodynamics, thermodynamics, sent me a note um, which will allow us to consider the three kinds of energy in this consultation. In the first third of this hour, she's very cool, very scientific, explaining her anxiety and depression. In the second third, things are very charged up at the decision point, standing on the chair with the noose around her neck and her hands on the noose. In the third, she is quite unleashed, eyes flashing with the satisfaction of revenge. Here's where the fiery pent-up body is on the verge of explosion. Already in the last five minutes, carried over to the next meeting, the third energy is being modulated to a sharpness. She is twirling her glittering scissors with a sharp wit. That is a modulation of murder. 
and a beautiful capacity for the reduction to absurdity of her antagonist. Like the influx of warm air from the Gulf of Mexico coming into collision with cold air from the Pacific Ocean in the Mississippi River Valley, the danger of discharge from lightning and tornado becomes greater and greater as the gradient of temperatures between the two fronts gets steeper. So let's look at the drawing on the right in conjunction. So we have Pacific cold air pressing in from the northwest. We have Gulf air, and, and that's the great Mississippi River Valley. And that, that whole boundary region is where there's tremendous danger of very high voltages from different energies. That little black dot there is kind of is where our warehouse sits, you see, because it's on exactly on that kind of front where there's very great danger of energy, you know, erupting, exploding into the other side. So, this is the kind of this is the kind of intersection of hot and cold that sets up tremendous voltages in the Mississippi Valley and in our patient on a much smaller scale. Thus, we could place the corporal warehouse as a tiny segment of this enormous front. As I argued in my last book, Borrowing from Rene Tomes Biology, everything depends on how close you are to the potential explosion. In other words, everything depends on the distance of the body from the social body. In other words, how do the body and social body intersect. In position one, the corporation would swallow up the patient. In position two, our patient explodes into the corporation. In position three, she can negotiate sharply. Fortunately, I could find in her a kind of transformer to bring down the voltages, voltages in her to an intensity that she could make sharp use of. Cool and deft, not heated up too much. So let us return, if you haven't already, Ed, from the drawing for the last couplet of the, of the lecture, in which I will summarize everything you will never forget. Wallace Stevens uh, wrote in a beautiful essay called The Noble Rider and the Sound of Words about Poetry. He wrote about the nobility of poetry, and this is, what he, and this is his sentence. It is a violence from within, pause, that protects us from a violence without. Thank you.